Great. Hi, everyone, and, and welcome to the first session of reproducibility for, for this academic year. We're delighted to see so many familiar faces and, and some new faces as well. Um, so today's session um, is going to look at a paper by Dr. Priya Silverstein and colleagues, and the title is Easing into Open Science. So just to introduce our speaker briefly today. So Priya is currently a research scientist at the Centre for Open Science, and she's also a community manager at the Journal Editor discussion interface. As well as this, she continues to work on their ongoing research projects in developmental psychology and meta-science. And she's also involved in training researchers at all career stages in open and reproducible science. So the format of today's session will be a presentation on this paper. So Laura and I are going to run through that briefly. And then we're kind of hoping that today really is just an opportunity for, for some discussion around, you know, easing into different kinds of open science practices and also for the audience to ask any questions um, about, you know, kind of I've, there's lots of people in the audience with with kind of experience in various open research practices. So we do want this to be as interactive as possible. So please feel free to, to ask any question at all about any of the open research practices mentioned today. So will we kick off with the slides, Laura? Yeah. Great. OK, so just to, mm. to start off, uh, for, for those of you that aren't familiar or are new to open research, so open research is kind of a, a broad term that encompasses lots of different practices in in science and research and that kind of all pivot around being transparent and, and being open about your kind of scientific methods, your approach to science, as, and, as well as um, the communication of your research practices. So kind of at the heart of open research is transparency and at every stage of the research cycle from the development of ideas all the way through to your data analysis and then in terms of your your inferences that you make from from your research and I think you know there are so many different ways to adopt open research and you know I think it is important to emphasize emphasize that there's no right way to do open research I think as long as you approach open research with kind of you know like a value for transparency and openness i think you know that's that that's the most important first step um, and i think you know the the idea of today's session is just to highlight that you know there there isn't a, a perfect way to do open science and you don't need to adopt all practices um at once and and you know it, it is okay to ease yourself into this way of working because you know it is quite different to to how things were done traditionally in the past um so and that kind of you know sits nicely with the the aim of the paper that we're going to be discussing today so the who's kind of you know objective was to act as a gateway for researchers to easily begin using open research practices and the paper has a really kind of nice framework where it introduces an open science practice and then it talks about you know why is this important how you can do it and then also worries that you know you might have in in adopting this practice and it mm -hmm. hopes to kind of reassure readers um in if they do have any of those concerns so do you want to move on to the next slide yeah. laura okay so um here are the kind of suggested eight practices that that emerged from this paper and these kind of fit at different stages of the research life cycle as you can see there on the screen so some of them are kind of associated with the kind of conceptualization of a project and then kind of moving through to design and the analysis as well as how you report and disseminate your findings um so what we're going to do um for the first half of today's session is just work through these these eight uh, practices um, but if you do have any questions please feel free to pop them in the chat or interrupt us and, and Priya um, one of the co-authors on the paper um, is happy to take any questions as well um, but if you'd like to leave those to the discussion at the end that that's perfectly fine as well and so I think Laura is going to take the first right. two yeah I'll kick off with the first two so uh, first um, practice that's described in the paper is to start an open science journal club or to join one and um, it's described as an easy level because it's a nice entry uh, level way of, of getting more familiar with the literature out there on open science. And uh, an example mentioned in the paper is actually reproducibility. And you're already doing this by being here. So well done. <laughs> um, the reproducibility website um, has a lot of uh, resources as well. It's, so the, the initiative started in Oxford in 2018 and since has spread out over the world really 
um, with groups setting up uh, journal clubs to do to discuss um, papers and ideas related to reproducible research and, and open research. Um, so what you could do uh, as a practice yourself is to um, facilitate some of the discussion of these materials, maybe in your own group, your own local group, or uh, get involved in the local community. And um, we're here, of course, to do these reproducibility sessions. So we have them once per month. Uh, so if you keep attending these, I guess you're also still already doing it. And um, there's also a Teams group where we try and kind of organize all the separate initiatives from the university. And um, it's all sort of gathered under the Edinburgh Open Research Initiative. So um, I'll put, pop the link in the chat in a minute and you can join the Teams group as well to stay up to date and to get more involved. And um, if you want to take maybe a, a bit more of an active role, that's also a way to get started and to get more involved in the community is to uh, join the group and, and see what you can do there as well and maybe promote the sessions if you <laughs> if you want to. So uh, yeah, this is the first step really to get engaged. And then um, moving on to the second uh, practice that was described in the paper is about the project workflow. And that refers to um, really organizing your project throughout your the research cycle of your project. So thinking about how to structure your files, how to um, conduct version control, and how to um, regulate who has access to what data at which time point and where you store that data to have clear records of where you stored what and and what's how, how things have been manipulated along the way. Because if you have this, um, if you have a good clear workflow, you can always find back what you did at what time. And this enhances the reproducibility if people have a clear idea of what you've done and you have a, like a clear recipe to repeat. It minimizes also the risk of making mistakes. For instance, by clearly naming your files, you're less likely to end up using the wrong version of the data to, in your analysis and then having to redo everything. Um, and also it facilitates collaborations with other people and with your future self. So if you leave a project for a while and then get back to it, you'll feel really appreciative of the fact that you've spent some time on organizing your project a certain way um, because it will just really help your memory. And I also wanted to refer back to a session we had last year with uh, Caitlin Hare, who presented um, uh, this paper on uh, by Markowitz um, about self, five selfish, re selfish reasons to work reproducibly. And um, there's a link here in the slides. We'll share the slides after the session as well. And um, she, she discussed this paper and all these reasons of uh, how to um, or why it's important to to think about your project workflow and also tips on how to improve your project workflow. And uh, one thing you could consider in this is also to make it openly available or at least imagine like you are doing so, so that you you work from the um, perspective that somebody would be um, coming to see your project and then uh, be able to reproduce everything you did. So one option for that is to use the Open Science Framework, which is a platform where you can uh, create projects and you can upload your materials to it. And then it's automatically version controlled and your project, I think only once it becomes published, but maybe Priya can uh, confirm that, that it creates a citable project DOI after it's been published. Is that correct? Or is it already a DOI if you're, um, if you keep a try of it? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd have to check that, but I guess the DOI it, wouldn't be very useful if it wasn't no, public yet. No, exactly. Yeah, so definitely once it's public, you can, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So that's a way also you could share your, um, yeah, basically the the life of your project with um, other people. Um, so do check out the Open Science Framework. Moving on to Neil. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So yeah, moving on to to preprints, um, which is a very easy practice to adopt. So I'm sure as many of you are familiar of of some preprint sites, so like MedArchive, BioArchive, and for those of you that aren't familiar with with preprints, essentially a preprint is a version of a manuscript that's made publicly available um, prior or during peer review. So I think. Nowadays, the kind of standard practice is, is once you submit your, your paper to a journal, you also submit it on or upload it onto one of these preprint preprint sites. And the kind of idea is that it gets your work um, out 
you know, into the world as soon as possible and, even, you know, it's not held up uh, in, in, in review for months on end. And, you know, a lot of journals do accept articles that have been made available as preprints already. And I know that some of them don't. So it is worthwhile just double checking if you have an, a journal in mind that you'd like to submit to. Just double check their their you know terms and conditions on preprints, but you know there has been some criticism on on preprints um in 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 the past that you know the it might increase your risk of getting scooped and kind of you know so, some people are quite apprehensive to, to use them um but I think they're they're becoming increasingly popular and the you know as as the the paper discusses the the kind of chance of or the risk of you getting scooped is is quite unlikely you know it's a time stamped document so you you have shown the world that you know you uploaded this paper on a certain date at a certain time um and you know it does increase the number of times an article is cited um as kind of that 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 reference highlights and you know even though preprints aren't peer reviewed and i think it is important that when you do approach a preprint that 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 it isn't like it hasn't got undergone peer review so you know you do need to maybe approach it with a more critical eye um but at the same time i you know i think preprints are, are, are a wonderful resource because it kind of shows that it, it can show the development of a project. So like this is the article in its form when it was submitted for peer review. And then, you know, you can update the you can update the preprint um, as you go along and put up newer versions. Um, and it just means that your your article is out there, um, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, and I see there's kind of some some stuff in the chat there. Um, Will was mentioning. Um, yeah, so yeah, it, as, as, as I said, just it's good to good to contact journals um, just to see what they're guidelines are on on preprints prior to uploading it okay great would you want to move on to the the next slide great um, so yes, yeah, so a reproducible code. Um, this is a slightly maybe kind of more challenging approach to adopt. Or I feel like it can be quite daunting. Uh, you know, as someone who's recently kind of learned to code, I feel like it does um, instill dread in a lot of people. But um, I, I would encourage you to to stick at it. Um, and as Laura mentioned in one of the earlier points, you know, your most important collaborator, you could argue, is your future self. And you know, there are just kind of some, I suppose, approaches that you could take to make your code more reproducible. Um, and the, when I when I say reproducible code, I mean that, you know, someone could read your script and know exactly, you know, what the purpose of the script is. And um, it give you know, you know, the context that this script was written in. Um, and I suppose there's different, you know, things that you can do to make your code more reproducible. So one of them is write readmes liberally. So, you know, for every, so a readme is a document that essentially doesn't necessarily contain a script for processing any data or for analyzing and um, it just explains you know okay what the purpose of the script is or what the purpose so you could have one they kind of um one suggestion um is to have a readme for in each folder um and this kind of goes back to what laura was saying about having a a very clear project workflow if you had a readme in each folder it could explain okay well here's how i'm going to name of all of my files here is how i'm structuring my my folders here are the scripts relating to kind of data processing here are the scripts relating to my analysis so that you know in a couple of months if you come back and have to analyze this data you can very quickly kind of reorient yourself with the project um, and um, in terms of commenting your code, so essentially these are kind of lines within your code that don't necessarily that like you're not running kind of it, they don't interact with the data anyway in, in any way, but they just kind of explain to you or to someone else using your code, um, you know, what what the lines are doing. So I just kind of inserted just a very simple example from some of my own code. Um, so one important thing or a piece of advice that I, I heard when I was starting off coding was that, you know, commenting your code isn't it's not about what your code is doing, it's why you're why you're coding it in that certain way, because there are so many different ways of commenting your code and of coding as well, if, if you want to manipulate data in in a certain way. Um, so, you know, one example here um, is to use our markdown. So I found this really helpful. Um, and, you know, it there, yeah, there's a little bit it, like it does take, like, you know, learning to code, I think for anyone who is very, very new to coding, it is a steep learning curve. But I think, you know, starting off your coding journey with this kind of reproducible workflow in mind re will really help you going along um, so that, you know, let's say if you need to repeat an analysis at a later stage, you have a very, very clear template that you can work off. Um, so, for example, 
in this just little screenshot of my code here, um, you can see that, OK, well, this is step one of my coding process. I normally like have a step for each part of my of my code. Um, so this is the data cleaning section. So I know like immediately, OK, well, all of this section re relates to data cleaning. Um, and then within our markdown, you can have like little chunks of or. So I'm saying here that, you know, I'm, this, I'm converting age and months to years and I'm saving that as a new variable. So that's what I'm doing on the lines 397 to 400. And then I'm checking that the new variable exists using call names. So that's just kind of, you know, um, is it just a way for me to check? OK, well, this is what what I've done and has it has it worked? Um, so, you know, this this is a very basic example of data cleaning, but I th or of data or c c commenting your code. But I think that the principle is the same for how regardless of how complicated your analysis is. Um, so, yeah, if you want to move on to the, the next section, Laura. Yeah, so uh, next point is uh, about sharing data which is also a uh, classified as a like medium difficulty um, open research practice. It refers to the practice of making anonymized data available for other researchers to use. Uh, and for example, a platform again for that could be OSF, but there's also many other platforms for um, specific types of data sometimes. Um, so it's worth checking out which one uh, is maybe most suitable to your work. And doing this allows others to first of all, reproduce and check your work. So it will help with the review of your work. Um, it's also very useful for people who want to do secondary data analysis. So maybe look at your data with a different research question or use it in meta analyses because for people conducting meta analyses, it's always really, really good if there's um, the raw data available. Um, sometimes it might be a, uh, a requirement from the funding source that your data has to be shared. Um, but even if it's not a, a harsh requirement, doing it anyways is still showing yeah, how that you're a transparent researcher and um, it might also be useful for your portfolio or for CV if you're, for instance, um, sharing some code and you want to do, you want to get a job in another field that also involves coding. It's nice if you have an example of your work there that you can refer to um, with a DOI, preferably, of course. Um, and some concerns, there are some legitimate concerns about this because um, from an ethical point of view particularly, it can be quite tricky to, uh, yeah, to really follow all the rules um, because there's a lot of regulations regarding um, data privacy, of course, um, for the participants who've, um, they've had to sign certain documents, certain consent forms, and those really specify what you can and cannot do with the data. But then there's also local data regulations and other GDPR regulations that were really in the EU. But I think the, the UK regulations are still mostly based on that, but things are, are open to change all of the time. So um, it's really important to check all these um, sources before you go about sharing your data. Um, just make sure maybe there's some, uh, there's probably some, some resources at the university that could help you with this as well. Um, if anybody knows, please po uh, post in the chat. And um, the paper also refers to this article by Meyer uh, with practical tips for ethical data sharing. So it's worth having a look at that as well. Um, another concern people might have is this scoop risk. So that if you publish your data, that other researchers may conduct the analysis that you had actually planned to still do. Maybe you're planning to do more analysis than the ones you've already done. and um, some things you could consider is uh, to delay sharing the full data set, but only the variables that you've already analyzed and that you're kind of done with. Um, you could also make sure to pre-register all of your own planned analyses and again have this um, published somewhere so that you can refer back to it and it states that you were the one who came up with this idea to do this analysis at that specific time point um, and then still pu publish the whole data if that's um, op optional for you. Um, and you could also decide to just share the metadata and then have a procedure in place to grant access to the full data. This is still better than just saying the data is available upon request because it's good if there's an actual procedure that has been tested that's in place so that it's actually possible for people to still get access to the data and a data go code book or something to help people figure out what would be in the data set to see if it's of interest to them. I think that's, yeah, that's another way to go if the data, for instance, is um, very sensitive. And um, 
Another concern could be that uh, you might not really get credits for doing all the hard work of data collection, but something you could do is to uh, apply a license to the data set and then, for instance, a Creative Commons license with um, uh, the option that people should reference you um, or uh, like acknowledge you as the, the source of the, um, of the data set. It still allows you to get some recognition for your work, even if other people are using your data set. So, those are some solutions the, uh, the paper discusses to some of these concerns. And then moving on to transparent manuscript writing. So this is really about putting all your cards on the table where you're uh, reporting about your project. Um, so this refers to, for instance, um, being very transparent about your hypotheses, how you've justified certain decisions in the, in the project, um, reasons, acknowledging reasons for missing data, or maybe how lack of funding has affected the sample size, things that have not gone according to plan. Um, just to be very, very open and honest about all these things and make it so open that people will really know what you've done again, like we've, we've said before as well. So the first step in doing this is really to log all the decisions carefully that were made in the project uh, across all the phases of the project so that you remember all this information. Um, some concerns with being this open about your project is that you're open to more criticism, so you're a bit, you might feel a bit more vulnerable. But it would be great for science, I think, if, if pe people start doing this and this becomes the norm. And I like this part in the paper where it talked about um, showing humanness in research. Of course, it's human that we might make mistakes or we, we make an error that has caused some missing data. It's it's very normal. It can happen. And I don't think people should feel like they have to hide that stuff. Um, and it also being open about these things makes it easier for others to peer review and actually see where your work sits in relation to other pieces of work in the field. And hopefully it will provide you also more specific feedback, which you can then use for later projects. Another concern is um, fitting all this information in because there's, of course, a balance between being open and being very detailed, but still having it um, concise and easy to read. So another option to deal with that is to put a lot of supplementary materials with your papers, just clarifying the specific steps in additional um, files that you could link to in your uh, manuscript. So for size reasons, that could be an option as well. All right, um, should we move on to pre-registration? <laughs> Yeah, great. And just kind of um, following on from the last point you made, Laura, about, you know, having a, a, a kind of mega sized supplementary material. And I think, you know, it's really it is important that, um, you know, we are open and we have transparent manuscript writing, but, you know, no one wants to read 50 pages of supplementary material. So one one option that I've seen that I think could, could work quite well is, you know, having links to, let's say, your GitHub repository. So that, you know, you can see like, OK, you know, um, here like you can give um, a brief description of, you know, how you process your code and then you can say or how you process your variables. And then you can say like, oh, you know, um, here's a link to my um, GitHub repository, which um, for those of you not familiar with GitHub, it's um, kind of a version control software and, and website, which means that you can you can upload your script and people um can you can yeah you have all your kind of scripts up there and people can see different versions of them um, and if you've commented your code well then people should be able to have a look at that let's say or markdown document and know exactly how you went from your kind of raw un unprocessed variable to the kind of final variable that you use in your model um so yeah, so um, just the last two points that um, we're going to talk about today um, relate to pre-registration and, and registered reports, and they they are related concepts. And um, one maybe with a kind of you know slightly higher degree of difficulty. Um, so um, for those of you that aren't familiar with a pre-registration, um, it's a time-stamped read-only version of your research plan created um, before you begin your data collection or data analysis, and. This, this reproducible research checklist was actually something that Laura and I um, made for some work we're doing with the psychology department at the University of Edinburgh for the, the final year undergraduate students. Um, so essentially we kind of, um, you know, we're creating a resource for undergraduates to, to engage with open research practices in their final year dissertation. Um, so, you know, we this was a kind of a good, I think, exercise for us to really kind of distill down, okay, well, what are the most important things that you need to think about when you're designing your research project? 
project. And we came up with this kind of research checklist or this kind of recipe that we kind of, you know, are encouraging the students to follow when they're coming up with their dissertation plan and their analysis plan. Um, so, you know, the idea is that you just kind of want to create, and, and I suppose the, the pre-registration and the registered report encompass all of the earlier points that, that Priya and colleagues outlined in, in, the, in the paper. Um, and, you know, even though, you know, so I, I suppose the reason that this uh, practice has a medium level of difficulty is I suppose there it, it is quite an undertaking but you know I, I I would say and kind of from like reading what others say as well it's not necessarily any more work you're just distributing the work in a different way so you are kind of front loading the work but but I really do think that your your future self will thank you so you know if you are very very clear and methodical sorry if there's some background noise we have builders in so apologies if you can hear that um but the idea is that you know you are just you kind of work through every stage of your research project from your general research question all the way through to what are my variables of interest what covariates am I going to use how am I going to test these hypotheses um, and then also things like you know how will I treat missing data? How will I treat skewed data outliers? Um, and then I think kind of most importantly, you know, what criteria am I going to use to make inferences about my data? Um, so like, you know, am I going to look at p-values and effect sizes and confidence intervals? And, you know, and, and what do each of these criteria tell me about my results and the kind of generalizability of my findings and, and, and whether or not they're meaningful effects? Um, and, you know, there are varying d levels of detail that you can that you can have for pre-registration um, and you know I think as a way of easing into open science you don't need to like I think going into it trying to create this perfect pre-registration is kind of just setting yourself up for failure I think that the the main takeaway is just that you want to be as transparent as possible about your approach to your research project um, and then you know you can kind of you it, it's you know you can kind of add as, as much detail as, as as is needed but you know it's something that you can um you can kind of come back to throughout the the research project so like let's say for example if you get to your analysis plan um or like so like let's say once you if you have your pre-registration it's a kind of like a time stamp document and then you collect your data and you go to analyze your data and you kind of you know maybe forget okay well what was i going to do with outliers what was i going to do with missing data like you have a project blueprint that you can come back to again and again um and you know as laura was saying earlier you know it's important to kind of emphasize that the hum the human side to 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 open research like you know you will make mistakes and it's not going to be perfect but you know you can just like add an amendment to the registered report saying that oh actually you know we decided for this reason to do something slightly differently you just need to be transparent about that and i think one of the worries that people have about pre-registrations and registered reports is that okay well they stifle creativity and they don't allow for exploratory analyses um and you know that 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 you know that isn't true like you you just it just creates a sense of accountability so that you need to be very clear about what's a confirmatory analysis and what's an exploratory analysis um, and the whole idea of pre-registration and registered reports and i suppose i should have kind of started with this is the um to kind of you know fight back against the reproducibility crisis in psychology where you know there's a bias towards significant findings and um you know to kind of stop people being tempted to to pee hack and and harking which is hypothesizing after the results are known um so yeah so i might actually just move on to registered report i feel like the, the points are are very very similar um but where a registered report differs from a pre-registration is that your research plan so like let's say your pre-registration for example and um, it undergoes peer review before the results are known um and this is i would say quite um quite yeah quite a difficult um open research practice to to undertake as someone who's like currently hopefully going to submit my stage one registered reports in the next couple of weeks um it, they do take a lot longer than you expect but you know the idea of registered report as you can kind of see on the slide here is that you have a peer review after your study design so you what that involves in practical terms is you submit your introduction and your methods and a very detailed data analysis plan to a journal and over 
I think it's well over 200 journals now accept registered reports. So it, like they are growing in popularity. Um, and then that undergoes um, peer review. And then you can get what's, um, what's called an in-principle acceptance. Um, so this means that, you know, regardless of what you find, as long as you stick to your research plan, the journal will publish your, your findings. And this is, again, just a way of, you know, I suppose, reducing bias towards significant findings. Um, and I think especially for early career, career researchers, it really creates a, a nice sense of security that, you know, even if you don't have significant findings, you know, you'll still get published. Um, so I think you know, as, as a PhD student, it's been really encouraging for me to know that, OK, well, you know, if I submit this, not only do I get like feedback from experts on my project and um, before I undertake my analysis, but I also am guaranteed a publication at the end of it. Um, and I suppose one worry that um, people might have is, you know, OK, what if my supervisor or my collaborators aren't supportive of the idea? Um, and as kind of Priya and colleagues outline in the in the the paper, you know, that that is a kind of legitimate concern. But I suppose if you just kind of engage with them in an, in an open um, and approachable way about what their concerns might be, and then maybe refer them to some open research resources to kind of reassure them that, you know, this is a robust way of publishing research and there are lots of benefits. And um, not only do you get feedback on your project before it's reviewed, but you're also guaranteed a publication. Um, so I think it, as long as you kind of approach them with that, um, kind of approach their concerns with that mindset, hopefully um, you'll you'll have a favor, favorable response. But, you know, as, as Laura and I kind of outlined at the start, like, you know, this a registered report is kind of maybe something that you might kind of work towards like there are so many practices that you can do in advance of this and a registered re report mightn't fit the timelines of timeline of people's project but you know pre a pre-registration is a very very good first step um so yeah i think that's um the kind of end of of, of that section but i just see that will has his hand up if if you want to ask a question will Hello. It's really interesting. There's um, loads of things that can be done with with registered reports. Then, after the initial peer review of the study design, will yeah. they then say, "Okay, we want you to update your design in these ways," and then upon doing that, then we'll accept it? Yeah, I presume. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's like it's almost what funders should do, isn't it? I mean, funders, you know, assess your research, but they never they either reject your funding proposal or not. They often don't say, "Oh, if you change your plans, then we'll accept it." Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. So I'm. I'm. Like. I'm hoping to um submit my um uh, my paper in the next couple of weeks. So I. I. I will feedback what the review process is like. But uh, <laughs> um, um, like I've heard from others that it, that like it it is really good and like it's it's very much strengthened their project because I think like you know there are so many different like decision kind of junctions that you come to in the development of a project and I think you know it, it it's very easy for reviewers like in the kind of traditional model of publishing to go like well why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that but like if you can actually get some feedback before you start your analysis and then you have the kind of you know guarantee that this will be published and um, it just I think it takes a lot of pressure off people um it'll, it'll make things more efficient as well because um you, you know you mentioned about stifling or why it shouldn't stifle creativity but often if you you have plans and you're not finding sort of positive results you know are things that you think will be of interest to publishers then you just might start going down blind avenues and speculating and looking for other things but if you know they'll accept it even if you're disproving your hypothesis or you know yeah, the null hypothesis is accepted or whatever then um yeah it would just you'll just stick to your guns and probably get it done more quickly yeah, exactly. And then, you know, if you do find like, because, you know, you, you can't think of every single possibility when you start off your project. So like, you know, if you find an interesting association that maybe you weren't expecting in your confirmatory analysis, you can do exploratory analysis. You just need to kind of say, OK, well, you know, here are findings from a confirmatory analysis mm -hmm. on the back of that. We were really interested in this association, so we explored it. But I think what happens now is like, you know, people have their confirmatory analysis and like not everyone does this, but it is the kind of because of the way of the reward system and how it's set up in academia, people tend to focus on the positive findings, go down this kind of rabbit hole. And if it's not significant, then they just keep kind of jumping to kind of other aspects of the project. And actually, you kind of lose sight of, you know, what did you like initially set out to find with this project? Um, 
And then I think it, it really, you know, makes it difficult for research to be transparent because you don't know the starting point from every journal or from from every um, research project because you just kind of get the the snazzy, significant novel finding at the end of it. So um, I'm, I'm confident that, you know, these research practices will will, will better the, the face of science going forward. Um, and yeah, I suppose to kind of maybe wrap up, I think they were the, you know, the eight points that were outlined in, in the paper. Um, and, you know, um, there are varying levels of difficulty, but I think the kind of um, Laura is going to kind of wrap up some of the key take homes. Are you yeah, ready? just a few things. I uh, just wanted to add one thing to this slide as well. It's just to say um, that might be a bit confusing from the um, the figure, but it's also possible to do this with secondary data. Just wanted to throw that in there. That it's, um, you don't have to still collect the data if you want to do this. It can also be done with secondary data. Anyways, um, yeah, so. Just to want emphasize again, it's not an all or nothing approach. Um, whether to engage in some of these practices or not, you can only make that decision really within your context of your personal situation, your, your project, your supervisors, and the constantly changing research culture that you're practicing in. And um, also just wanted to link to um, the paper's uh, associated OSF page uh, that has listed lots of useful resources. I'll just post that in the chat just now um, with also um, I think there was a reading list there as well that was referred to and uh, yeah definitely check out the paper and the, the resources associated with it and um, then we are moving on to the discussion so uh, for all the attendees who have questions feel free to post them in the chat or to raise your hand uh, in the room and we also have a couple of questions that we could maybe start with um, so uh, maybe you should just kick up with the first one. Um, so Priya, if you're if you were rewriting this paper this year, would there be any new or updated practices that would have made the list now, or would it still be pretty much the same? Do you think? Yeah, I think I think that's a really great question. I haven't had that one before. I think rather than any additional practices, um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any that I would add. But I think a lot of the information would be updated now, like to basically just show how these a lot of these practices have when they were new they kind of were quite specific um like for example taking registered reports would have only been for um you know new data collection and then now all of these things are kind of developing and um kind of getting more specific versions for different fields and kind of working out what works so i think like yeah it, i would probably focus add add more resources on kind of um the different options you can go down with any of the policies i think Okay. Not policies, practices, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And have you seen in the last couple of years since you started writing this paper, have you seen any um, the impact of these practices or how people's perspective has changed now that they are more common? Yeah, I think it's great to see that like so many people are kind of um, like new new students are kind of doing these things right from the beginning of their PhDs, for example, um, just kind of seeing it as normal to do pre-registration and things like that. I think also a big difference that I've seen, I, I think it's going to be different everywhere, but is also in now that these practices have become more mainstream, I think often supervisors are a little bit less scared than they used to be when I was doing my PhD. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think that like now they kind of you know, they see other people in their department maybe doing registered reports or doing pre-registration and then they aren't as scared as they used to be. So maybe students aren't having as much of pushback. But like I said, that's going to be like super different depending on like geographical location and department, different departments and things like that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy also how much in can change in a couple of years only. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And what do you think is the best way to promote adoption of our practices? That's actually a question that we just want to know also, because how can we be more effective also in, in getting people engaged? Do you have any any tips for that? Um, yeah, I think that you're doing, I mean, you're doing the absolute best thing that you could be doing right now. I think engaging people together, especially early career researchers um, and training them in how to do these things, kind of being able to have a space where you can discuss um, issues that people are having or questions that people have that is like the main important thing because I think a lot of people 
have these and that's also why we kind of wrote the paper a lot of people have these like myths that they hear uh, about the practices and things that scare them and being able to kind of alleviate those fears through conversation and sharing resources I think is so important but I also think obviously that top-down change is like really important as well so I think these things need to be happening at the same time I think in terms of like you can do it's obviously easier for early career researchers to do the first one like with kind of sharing resources and bringing each other up um but also where people can push um kind of uh things at a higher level in their department you can kind of start with the department and then see if you can go to university and then there's people obviously working at a national and international level people who have um you know editors working at journals um uh so yeah it's kind of i think the combination of the bottom up and the top down together works really well and kind of um in i think there's not kind of an obvious one that should come first i think a lot of people are very convinced oh no how can we be expected to do this stuff if it's not incentivized um and i think early career researchers especially have shown that that's not true like we will do it even sometimes when it's not incentivized and in the hope that it will become incentivized and i think in a lot of ways that has worked out for, for a lot of us so um yeah both at the same time hopefully um that's how we change culture great um i see that crispin is also uh put in a suggestion to contact the course organizers of course I guess at the university and suggest to include this in the uh, perspective in the courses um, and to really have this an integrated section in in the uh, university courses I think that would be really cool um, yeah as Neve was saying we've we've kind of tried a, a pilot thing with this in um, a particular group of uh, undergraduate uh, psychology students who are finishing their dissertation and we hope to get some feedback from that as well and then maybe we can give that back to the university somewhere and say hey people are enjoying this maybe you should consider putting this in more courses and also just um about your point again for having that um group that space available where people can ask questions and share resources i'm just gonna spam the the chat again with the eri teams link because if you join this teams there's there's um yeah, we've we've decided with it was the reproducibility team first, but we've decided with ERI to really combine efforts, and it's, it's really supposed to be a place for people to to ask these questions, to share resources. If you have your own initiative or group, um, please feel free to add your own channel to the teams. It's just a way for us to sort of all get involved and um, uh, what you say, like bring all these initiatives together and get people together, and who will all have will have different. Um, knowledge on different topics and um, one of my hopes for this year is really to see if we can get more people from like different departments as well so some departments that may not traditionally be as inclined to um, consider open research practice because it seems very very big in um, psychology and biological sciences but it's uh, it's sometimes less clear how you how you can apply some of these principles in different uh, subjects or different topics. So I don't know. I think it's a an interesting discussion, especially if there's going to be top down influences at some point. We need to make sure that how how these practices will affect different departments in different ways. So um, yeah, that's what we kind of hope to achieve by creating a platform like this as well. And um, anybody from the uh, audience have more questions for Fria about the paper or about in general? Try to act this perspective. Okay, bye, Chris. But <laughs> um, yeah, please feel free to raise your hand and speak up, or uh, or just unmute, or put something in the chat. Um, and if do you have any more questions, or will us will? Yeah, I've just unmuted myself. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, that's fine. Um, so for people who don't know me, so I, uh, I'm involved in sort of open science, open research initiatives at the university. There's the League of European Research Universities, of which the University of Edinburgh is a member, who published um, an open science roadmap several years ago and are encouraging their own members, um, there's 23 members, to 
to publish their own roadmaps, to, to devise ways to promote um, and advance open research at their um, institutions. And so we're trying to do that at Edinburgh and we will be publishing a roadmap soon. And some other people who are attending this meeting today have been heavily involved with that. But I think the point, and Larry makes this in, in their roadmap documents, I think the research culture, the cultural side of things and the acceptance of that is key. Um, I think we've seen it certainly in biomedical research since COVID began. Um, the acceptance and sort of embrace of preprints has really taken off. And my hope is that that's kind of broken down. A bit. Science is kind of stupid in a way because it should be about challenging and testing new ideas and embracing uncertainty. And yet the way we approach scholarly communication and data sharing is really conservative and um, dogmatic and just it's not evidence based. It's really annoying. So I, I think with the embrace of preprints, it's maybe broken down a bit of resistance and a barrier to trying new things. And people are becoming a bit more aware that, oh, you can you can share things without them being peer reviewed publications. It doesn't necessarily open you up to scooping and it has lots of benefits in terms of uh, communicating your research and collaborations, you know, et cetera, lots of things. Um, so I think that's good. And my hope is that as people have lessened that resistance to trying new things, that that could then extend over into registered reports, et cetera. The registered report seems like a no brainer. I don't know why it isn't just done everywhere, but I get, um, I've not done it. But I mean, yeah, it seems seems like a really obvious thing to do. Uh, I'm just kind of rambling here and just sharing my no, thoughts. But, but um, yeah. yeah uh, uh, so in, in terms of in advancing open research, open scholarship practices at the university, I think there's these cultural shifts that need to be made. And then Crispin mentioned in the chat, if we can try and raise awareness by formally incorporating teaching about open research approaches and benefits, et cetera, in, in taught courses at undergrad or maybe postgrad level, I think that would be great as well. But um, I, I think, yeah, it's great that you have papers like Piers that sort of show how, what's the e what are the easy ways of doing this? Because um, then it can help to facilitate it. People aren't so resistant. Um, yeah, that's my rambling finished. It's not really a question, but it's just a comment. The university is very aware of this. We're trying to advance it. And as um, Laura and Neve said, we're hoping that this EORI team can act a bit like a hub to bring people together because there's a lot of interest in this around the university. Often we act, uh, we're working in little silos on the same thing. So if we can sort of try and consolidate that and um, and bring people together, then hopefully it can advance things a bit more um, uh, efficiently. All right, that's my rambling done. <laughs> um, yeah, so just on the registered reports, it, that reminded me of, so when you asked if there's anything that I would have included in paper now, I think one of the most exciting things that has changed with the registered reports um, is this new initiative, uh, I'm not sure if any, if, if you've heard of it, called PCI registered reports. So it's basically, um, peer community and registered reports so it's uh instead of kind of sending your paper to a journal as its first uh place that it gets reviewed you instead send it directly to pci, PCI registered reports and um, and they review it and then if they accept there's journals that have basically signed up with pci registered reports to either say that we if you accept um a stage one register report we will then kind of you if a, the author can choose to publish it with us if they want or there's i think there's like a tear down where it's like they don't promise that they will but they like promise that they'll look at it or something i don't know um i'll, I'll, I'll put the details in the chat but the exciting thing about it is um well firstly that you if it gets accepted you get to choose from any of the journals that have kind of signed up to this and there's more being added every day but the thing that i think is like even more important is that they do this thing called scheduled review um that you can choose so basically what you say so one of the biggest complaints that people have about registered reports is that the review process takes ages they kind of find it impossible to make any plans because they don't know when they're going to be able to collect data to, you know, some, maybe there's a certain population, maybe you're working in schools and you need it to be kind of at the start of a specific term or something like that, um, or maybe, you know, just anything. You just, you just kind of need to know what's happening. 
Um, and so with scheduled review, you send basically like a, not the whole paper, but just like a little summary of the paper. Um, and if, if it's invited for like full review, then you set a date at which you will submit the stage one registered report. So that's just the introduction and the methods um, and any kind of supplementary method stuff that you need to um, upload and out, maybe analysis plan and things like that. Um, and you you say, OK, I'm going to have it in first of January. Um, that's a terrible date to have it in. You wouldn't enjoy your Christmas at all. But anyway, um, <laughs> so you say a date when you're going to um, have it in. And they basically schedule reviewers. They ask reviewers in advance, would you be free to review this paper in this week or whatever? Um, and they say, yes, I would. Um, and so then what happens is you submit your paper and immediately it's reviewed because they've already lined up those reviewers. It's amazing. It's such a good idea because then you aren't waiting all these months for review. And I think like the turnaround has been like in the ones that they've done is like a couple of weeks or something like that. I know it is. It's it seems like too good to be true, but it also seems like the kind of thing that they like just should do. Everyone should do. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if any um, other like if any journals specifically do scheduled review i only know of it through pci registered reports um so yeah it's definitely worth um looking at i will put the link in the chat um yeah uh, and i think will says another interesting development is review commons where you submit your paper not to a journal but for general peer review then once reviewed you have the choice of journals to submit to the approach decreases re redundancy in peer review um if rejected from one journal you don't go through a roulette wheel of another round of completely new peer review yeah that's exactly so this review common sounds exactly like pci registered reports it's just that so they're doing exactly the same thing it's not being reviewed with a journal it's just being reviewed through pci registered reports and um, the difference is that pci registered reports is registered reports only and also that they have this option for this scheduled review which i'm not sure that review commons does but yeah it seems like there's a few different initiatives doing this and um, so it's worth just checking the different ones which journals are signed up with them because obviously you you kind of wouldn't want to submit and then none of the journals apply to your um your field or anything like that i know that with pci registered reports um royal society open science is one of the journals so that's quite general so if you're interested in publishing and you know that it's it's likely that your research would be covered by that if you were interested in that journal um so yeah that's that's my little spiel that sounds I'll very go. interesting actually yeah and i can't believe that this hasn't been the way it's been done all along you know it sounds such a good solution to a problem that's been there for so long um and yeah it's interesting also the, the review comments here as well um yeah i was just gonna follow up now that sounds like an amazing yeah. service i'm gonna check that out because i i think i saw like so I had heard of PCI registered reports, but didn't really look into them. I was trying to like get my registered report written, but I definitely, definitely going to check that out. Um, and I think kind of, um, you know, just following on from what you were saying, Priya, about, you know, registered reports being typically associated with data collection based projects, like, you know, things have really evolved since then. So like the registered report that I'm doing is for secondary data analysis. And I think especially these really big data studies very much encourage like pre-registration and registered report um, because you know there's yeah there's just kind of so many decisions that you can make and I think especially when you have lots of different people using the same data set they want to you know kind of really interrogate the results to, to see whether or not they're generalizable or whether or not they're robust and there's so many resources out there like I know on the OSF they have templates for registered reports and pre-registrations for even like qualitative work as well so I think you know as Laura was saying we're really hoping that the EORI and reproducibility you know that it this is a hub for people to to get involved in in open science um no matter like you know how how little or how big um a way you want to get involved in that there's a, like you know it, it's not an all or, all or nothing approach and even if you just make one small change um it, it is a step in the right direction um but i'm just quite conscious that we're kind of going towards yeah. the end of our time does anyone have any questions from the any audience questions for Priya? Yeah. if not then i might just go to the final slide that's yeah. all right so, um, well, first of all, we wanted to, of course, thank Priya for being here today. And um, I think the paper is really worth a read. If you haven't read it yet, please go and do it. It's especially if you want to maybe get other people um, informed about what open research really is or what, yeah, what could be basic um, things to start with, just refer them to the paper. And 
Um, we'll definitely share your uh, resources in the, the Teams group as well. So, and thank you so much for being here. Um, it's always really nice. It, it brings the paper alive if you see the people who wrote it. <laughs> um, and just wanted to announce that uh, Will, Dr. Will Carthen, who has been really, yes, I'll put the links. I was going to do that in a minute. Um, will be uh, the one doing the next session on 15 October, uh, same time. And that session will be about building an open research culture in your research group. So very uh, following on nicely from the discussion we've had today, actually. And um, there are some new developments at the university here. So uh, some exciting things that there's now a new blog, if I can get the link up. Um, there's a, a new uh, open research blog um, by the university, by the um, library services, research support services, if I'm referring to that correctly. Or so. um, and uh, Carrie Miller is very involved in the news newsletter as well. And um, she shared with us as a sign up link that people can sign up to the new open research newsletter for. So um, it's a nice way to stay up to date with um, open research developments at the university here as well. So yeah, things seem to be moving <laughs> at the university. Um, I would just strongly encourage everyone to jump on board of the open research train. <laughs> what a cheesy comment to end the session with. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, any final comments, Maria, Anyone else? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank, thanks so much for having me. It was really interesting. And um, if anyone has any questions, like uh, informally, you can always um, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter um, or by email. I'm like, yeah, I constantly have people just being like, is this a thing? Or like just asking weird little questions. If, if I mean, it seems like you've got a really good group here and that you would feel comfortable to ask each other. But if anyone doesn't, you can always, yeah, I'm always open to those kind of things. I love active procrastination, as I call it. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Oh, thank but you. yeah, That's I think this, nice. yeah, uh, to echo what Priya said, like, de like this is a new, like th these are kind of new practices, and like you know, uh, like I would definitely recommend um, jumping on the open research um, train, as, as as Laura said. But like you know, don't be afraid to ask ask for help because it can be really daunting. Like you know, it, it is new, and I think if you're the only person in your research group trying to push this forward, like it is really intimidating. But you know, we 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 want reproducibility and the EORI to be that like support network for you. So if you do have any questions like no matter how small or you just want to get started or like have a chat like please get in touch that's that's why we're here and and the more people that embrace this the kind of you know more of a force for change will be um, and it's great to have people like Will Cawther and really leading this kind of at like you know kind of from the top down as well so I think we just need to like attack from all sides and we'll bring about <laughs> a kind of radical systems change but um yeah but like turning up to reproducibility sessions like this is is a great kind of first step um but yeah I think we'll 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 leave things there um thanks Priya again for such a wonderful resource um and yeah as Laura said highly encourage you to to refer to Priya's paper Nice Great. Yep. Have a lovely weekend, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Bye, everyone.